About a year ago, we covered a little film known as Rent-A-Cat by director Naoko Ogigami. Okigami has been consistently working for about 20 years now in Japanese cinema, though unfortunately none of her films have really crossed over to this side of the Pacific. This isn't to say that she's lacking in international awards. Those have fairly consistently come Okigami's way. But we're not concerned so heavily on this show with film festivals. No, we mean to say that none of Naoko Okigami's films have received wide releases in the West, or really any releases in most cases. Rent-A-Cat might not have been the deepest thing we've ever covered on this channel, but it was a charming, meditative romp on humanity in our relations with our feline companions. Needless to say, that was enough for us to get our foot in the door with Ogigami's filmography. And once we kept going with her films, we discovered one of the most interesting currently working filmmakers we've found since beginning Cinema Nippon. Full disclosure, we're pretty biased here. We've come to like Naoko Okigami. Like, like her a lot. Like her enough to import her earliest projects, the ones that don't even have fan subs, on Japanese DVD. Yeah, our Japanese ain't that good, but her movies sure as hell are. That being said, we figured it was high time for us to pay our dues get back to our roots, and cover some less-known filmmakers here on the channel. Over the coming months, we're going to be delving into the bulk of Ogigami's filmography, one film at a time. Given how surprisingly diverse her five major projects and four earlier works are, yet how close-knit they are in terms of pathos and theming, we thought it best to break them down with one video per film. If you haven't already, go check out that Rent-A-Cat video to get the skinny on Ogigami's backstory. Otherwise, there's more than enough going on with Naoko Ogigami's major breakthrough to fill this video's entire runtime, so let's jump right on in with the film that came six years before the feline-driven project, 2006's Komome Diner. Oh, and don't worry, this one does have fan subs, so if it piques your interest, this may be the easiest of Ogigami's films to get your hands on. Komome Diner, or Seagull Diner in English, tells the tale of being a stranger in a strange land. In this case, we're following a Japanese woman in Finland with a love of animals, namely seagulls and cats. Sachie, our lead here, moves from Japan to Finland on something of a whim in order to open her own diner. Why does she do this? Well, we're given several explanations throughout the film as to why she moved and why she chose to open a diner in the capital of Finland. Sachie tells another Japanese woman, Midori, at one point that it's because the Japanese and the Finns share salmon as a common food, and that she believed the Finns would like good, basic food. She says this, and then immediately admits this to be a lie. Why Sachie does what she does before the film's launch isn't really what Naoko Ogigami is interested in here. In her own words, quote, My films are always about outsiders and misfits. Perhaps the characters are a bit like me. End quote. Similar to how the Rent-A-Cat protagonist constantly lies about the origins of her money and her life story, Sachie never lets us know exactly how she ended up in Helsinki. Ogigami wants to ignore all of this backstory and focus solely on Sachie and her exploits in Finland. By obfuscating the truth, she allows us to project onto her. Nothing inherently sets us, as foreigners in foreign countries, apart from her as we may be were we given more specific contexts to which we can't relate. This is compounded by the other women who Sachie encounters in her new residence. In the process of running the titular Kamome Diner, Sachie runs into two other Japanese women, Mirori and Masako. She relates to them over being Japanese in Finland, a rarity in this film's universe, which is exemplified not only by the language barrier, but also by the strange looks repeatedly given by a trio of elderly Finnish women outside the diner. Conversely, the distance is bridged by some of the Finnish characters who are more willing to connect with Sachie, Midori, and Masako. Sachie, in particular, fosters relationships with a young Finnish man studying Japanese, a middle-aged man who bonds with her by teaching her how to make a damn fine cup of coffee, and a middle-aged woman who is so down and out and who can only break through her staunch veneer when under the influence of heavy liquor. Kamame Diner deals largely in this manner with xenophobia and whatever the inverse of xenophobia is. 
It explores how the locals in Helsinki and the trio of Japanese women interact with one another, for better and for worse, though admittedly this is still in Ogigami's trademarked feel-good style. Don't go expecting any aggressive takes on racism or anything like that. This is certainly a cozy film to say the least. And yet it's in this context that we can examine what it's like to be a foreigner living in a different country with varying degrees of language proficiency. Sachie and company deal with the ire of several Finns throughout, namely a gaggle of middle-aged women who seem to scoff incessantly about the diner and Sachie's presence. After some time, however, their interests converge through one of the most simple, basic needs a human has. Food. We see through the growth of this relationship how, in spite of not having a ton of crossover in the language department, something as universal as a need for food and a want for, good food, can bring people together. The elderly women reject the presence of Sachie and her compatriots until they realize that she can speak their language in terms of flavor. I don't know what to say. It's, it's awkward. The, the, the... Sorry, man. with cinnamon buns, something most Europeans will likely understand and appreciate. On the other hand, we have a Finnish boy who asks Sachie about the theme song to the show Gatchaman. Sachie knows she should know the lyrics, but can't quite put her finger on them. In turn, when Sachie is out in public later that day, she runs into our second protagonist, Midori, who she asks about the Gatchaman theme. This scene is of particular note, given that Sachie spots another woman she believes to be Japanese in Helsinki, and she immediately asks about a common piece of pop culture rather than whether she even speaks the same language. Visually, Ogigami here uses the space of the cafe where Sachie and Midori bond in a remarkable way. The two are shown to be the outsiders in this space. They sing the song together, with Midori taking point and Sachie following as she scribbles down the lyrics. Suddenly, the camera pulls out and we realize we're seeing two women in their own bubble amidst an entire cafe of Finns who stare at them. The women are unaware, thanks to their companionship, of their otherness. They have formed a pocket community in this moment, which continues beyond this point thanks to the emotional needs of Sachie and the housing needs of Midori. Essentially, Midori also ended up here on a whim, yet she had no intent of beginning a life in Finland. She literally selected the area at random and has no plan past stopping in this cafe. Sachie offers her a place to stay and a job at the Komome Diner, which Midori takes up without a thought. Interestingly, this scene also shows how Sachie is taking part in the same sort of stereotyping as the Finns. She approaches and asks another Japanese woman if she knows this song, which shows a lot of assumption on Sachie's part. Midori could very well have never been exposed to Gachaman, or else she might not remember the song. Sachie, however, takes the chance and asks her if she recalls the song based on nothing more than Midori reading a book printed in Japanese. Whether this is stereotyping on Sachie's part, the momentary bond over a children's TV show has seen them becoming absorbed in the company of one another. In the long run, this momentary connection extends to a longer friendship. Here, Komome Diner explores how the important part is human connection, taking the plunge and simply talking to one another rather than remaining secluded in our own little bubbles. Meanwhile, the film in the same conversation goes on to show how we construct our understanding of the world through our experiences. Midori and Sachie commiserate on how they understood Finland to be a different place than Japan. At the same time, the two women argue that their ideas were misguided, as they've found mostly similar locations – cafes, bookstores, and the like. As they discuss other potential locations for vacations, we then see the fabrication of our, and their perspectives, on places we've never visited. They talk about Tahiti and Alaska both of which are then shown as constructions of places they've seen, and flimsy props. Their understanding of far-off lands, as with Finland before their arrival here, are based solely on their own experiences and the objects that are stereotypes of those locations. This perspective is compounded when we see the expectations of the third main character, Masako, who says she expected Finland to be a laid-back land after seeing it on TV in Japan. Reality, on the other hand, is more mundane as she learns quickly. 
Regardless of these expectations, Kamome Diner deals primarily with the reality that arises as a citizen of the world. In other words, we're interested not just in seeing how Sachie, Midori, and Masako cope with moving to a foreign land, but also with the locals carving out their own place in the world. Most directly, we see how Sachie and Midori, and eventually Masako, form a pocket community in Finland, but assimilate to an extent into Finnish culture. Sachie provides a service with her restaurant, specifically for Finns. As she puts it, quote, it's a diner, not a restaurant. I don't want to cater to homesick Japanese or Finns looking for sushi." End quote. Instead, she wants to make comfort food that all can appreciate. Sachi is not banking on her status as a Japanese expatriate to sell coffee and sushi, but is more interested in running a good cafe. She has no real expectations toward success other than people dropping in and having a meal. The delivery of this statement is followed up by a jilted Finnish guy showing up and teaching her how to make amazing coffee. This is essentially a form of cultural exchange, as both parties end up benefiting from their crossover. She brings the Japanese comfort food, and he teaches her how to make good Finnish coffee. This helps both sides better define their place in the world in the process. Further exploring how cultural exchange can assist in connecting individuals, the three Finnish women, who scoff endlessly from outside the diner, are finally drawn into Kamome Diner via the smell of cinnamon buns. Compared with the onigiri she and Midori had tried to sell previously, these buns are a more familiar food, which puts a foot in the door for international bonding. In other words, these cinnamon buns are to these characters as Rent-A-Cat was to us, pushing us to examine Ogigami's filmography more thoroughly thanks to something as universally loved as cats. Compared with the self-assured Sachie, Midori is somewhat in limbo, having picked Finland at random for her travel destination. In terms of the film's meaning, an argument for fate could be made here. She met Sachie seemingly at random, which might not have happened if it weren't for the Finnish boy asking about Gachaman. This convoluted series of events is almost too good to be true. On the other hand, this could be an argument that, no matter where we go, we can find similar people. Kamome Diner might be arguing that we are all human, regardless of our cultural differences. In other words, whether Sachie ran into Midori or not, we're reminded of all the connections Sachie has made with the locals. They're all just people. Masako is in another form of limbo, with hers being physical rather than spiritual. While Midori chooses this location at random, Masako has simply lost her luggage, literally all of her possessions, during a flight. She must purchase new clothing once she settles into her new position as being stuck here, thus changing her visual look given that she's been made to start over with nothing but the money she brought to Finland. In the meanwhile, however, she gives away what food she has to the seagulls by the docks, the very birds for which the diner is named thanks to Sachie saying they remind her of a fat cat from her childhood. Midori and Sachie never show any real desire to move on from Helsinki, while Masako concludes the film with different horizons in mind. She takes the time while the airline searches for her luggage to learn from the culture before wondering aloud if it's time to move on. She has nowhere to go, traveling to the forests at the suggestion of the anime boy in another form of cultural exchange. She remains mostly reserved compared with Sachie and Midori, yet this has its own merits in terms of bonding with other humans. This helps Masako break down the barrier of the jilted Finnish woman we mentioned earlier. Though she doesn't speak a lick of Finnish, Masako allows the liquored up woman to pour her heart out the entire time hearing her story in full. Midori's character could be seen as an argument toward finding those within our group outside of our homeland, in this case other Japanese citizens in Finland, while Masako is an argument for finding a place no matter where you go and with whom. As the group agree about the reserved woman, quote, a sad person is sad in any country, end quote. In other words, showing how some human aspects transcend language or borders. Through repetition and shared cultural aspects, Kamome Diner shows what it's like to be alone in a foreign land, as well as how we learn from other cultures. Sachie, learning from the Finnish man, proclaims, 
Kopi Luak to incite the spirit of the Palm Civet's poop coffee while producing the best coffee she's ever made. From here, Sachie teaches the other Japanese women this trick, helping bridge one small gap between Finnish and Japanese culture. Meanwhile, the Finnish woman, depressed at the loss of her husband, nails a straw doll representing him to a tree, a practice utilized in Japanese occultism for the sake of casting curses. Through these many, many crossover points, Kamome Diner explained to us back in 2006 how similar we are as humans, and how we seek to bond across cultural and physical borders. Whether we're like Sachie, someone bringing culture, Midori, someone looking for spiritual guidance, or Masako, someone looking for a place in life regardless of language. The film shows how we can learn from one another if we set aside our preconceptions and take a step outside our front door. Before we go though, there's one more thing we ought to mention that occurred years after the film's release. We mentioned earlier how Midori's interactions with Sachie might be used as an argument for fate, or for chance. Well, in much the same way, in 2013, a relic of the March 11, 2011 tsunami and earthquake in the Tohoku region of Japan washed ashore in America. This small fishing boat had spent roughly two years drifting across the entirety of the Pacific, leaving from Rikuzen Takata, a fishing town severely hit by the natural disaster, and arriving in Crescent City, California. This arrival led to a bond being forged between these two towns, which in turn sparked the creation of a children's picture book titled The Extraordinary Voyage of Kamome, A Tsunami Boat Comes Home. If you didn't catch that, the name of the boat was Kamome, Seagull, the same name as Sachie's diner. Amy Uyaki, the artist for this children's book, stated, quote, I want those who read the book to see that, though we may be separated by miles, languages, culture, and religion, we all share the same basic hopes and fears. Kamome traveled thousands of miles and ended up in a community much like the one it had left behind." End quote. And though this might seem like a big old tangent with which to end the episode, we felt like this quote from Uyeki encapsulates the spirit of Kamome Diner better than we might have hoped to on our own. It's a simple film about connecting people across languages, cultures, borders, and thousands of miles. And it's a beautiful portrait of life in the modern world which deserves a second look from anyone looking for a cozy film about good food, humanity, and seagulls. <laughs>